Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to your next Criminology instalment. This is for Unit 4 and it is 2.1. Right, let's get going. Two point one then is explain forms of social control. Nice and straightforward. And explain means that you do not need to evaluate any of these. You just need to explain them. So first of all, I got my students to write a list of all the reasons why people abide by the norms, values and moral codes of society that they live in. Why do we actually follow the norms? Why do we actually follow the values and the moral codes? And then all the reasons they come up with, I got them to write whether they were internal, they come from somewhere inside, as you just know you should or should not do that, or is it external? Is there something that would happen externally as the reason why you behave in that way? So my students discussed how um, they mention things like conscience, that's more of an internal reason why they follow the moral codes and have values. External things would be like the law, or the external things would be things like punishment, like being grounded by parents or being suspended from school. And so there's lots and lots of reasons why people obey these norms, values and moral codes within a society. And this topic is looking more specifically at those areas. You need to be able to explain them forms of social control. Are they internal? Are they, I don't know what, what's happening with the screen, the PowerPoint uh, slide for this one. Um, the, the ones that you need to know are rational ideology, tradition, internalisation of social rules and morality. This PowerPoint will go through each of these. The external ones are your coercion, your fear of punishment and your control theory is the reasons for abiding by the law. So these are all the areas you need to know. You also have a number of links to Unit 2 again and the situations case studies from Unit 3. So my advice is the sooner the better, find your Unit 2 notes. If you don't have many Unit 2 notes, go back to the earlier lockdown videos that I did last year. Find your notes on these areas because these were what will really, those links to previous topics, get you those extra couple of marks in each area. So in Unit 2, we've already studied the idea of societies have norms, values and moral codes. So last year, you looked at what norms were, what values were, what moral codes were and why we, um, why we followed them, looking at people like Freud and Skinner and Bandura. We looked at things like, um, you know, the genetic makeup of people, etc. So I got my students then to write down three norms, values and moral codes, three things in society that we do and follow. I then got them to write down what happens if people don't follow these. Um, and this then links in with the ideas of deviance. We've done deviance a lot. Deviance is something that should be really easy for you to understand now. Deviance is obviously where you deviate from the norm. This can be good or it can be bad. So, for example, Sir Tom, when he raised all of that money in lockdown, that was deviant. That was against the norm. People don't raise millions of pounds like he did. Um, you also have deviants, which can be bad things like owning 40 cats or wearing socks with sandals. I'm joking on that one, of course. Um, but deviance most often though, has more negative connotations than positive. Sanctions then for these can be formal or informal. Formal is when you actually kind of get something in paper, on paper. That's the easiest way of seeing it. So a formal suspension, a formal warning, um, being locked up. Uh, going to prison that's all formal informal can be things like if someone pushes in the queue at Sainsbury's you might tut at them you might roll their eyes you might chunter to yourself um that those are certain things that I would do you might be far more bold and actually say to them excuse me there's a queue um but they're informal ones so again I got them to write down three sanctions formal or informal for deviant behavior and then just why society expects people to do this. So obviously we run smoothly. We want a society that runs well and runs smoothly. And so that's why we expect people to follow them. And then why is deviance itself a problem? Why is people that deviate from this a problem? Because obviously part of that is, is that they then create an unbalance in society. They create, obviously if you keep 40 cats and 
you know, they're in your house, then they're not hurting anybody. Obviously, if you look after them, of course, but certain deviances are things that do affect the public and do affect other people. And so you cause a disbalance in society. Number one, then, internal forms of social control. Most of the time, we don't need someone else to tell us not to break the law. Most of the time, you just know that you should and should not do certain things. We regulate and control our own behaviour. You don't need to, someone to tell you on a morning that you need to put your clothes on before you leave the door um, because you regulate yourself. You know that's against the norms and essentially against the law. This might come from your own moral code or conscience, and these are self-controlled. So the internalisation of social rules. In Unit 2, we did study certain theories. So I got my students to research and write down what they could find for Freud and the superego, how we internalise it. Skinner's operant conditioning, the idea of rewards, positive rewards, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement and punishment. And Bandora's social learning theory, the idea of vicarious reward, vicarious punishment and the Bobo doll, etc. So it's important that you do get some notes on those areas because it helps later on in this topic. Continuing then with internal forms of social control, tradition and culture. Let me just pop them all up there. This links to the way that our individual internal set of moral principles happens. This could be the traditional culture we grow up in, such as religion. Um, religion is an example of, um, you know, culture and tradition that we have. So, for example, the Ten Commandments are followed by Christians and Jews. The idea of zakat or charitable giving in Islam, apologies for any pronunciation errors there. Or principles like asim sir. Ahimsa. Um, this again is non-violence, which is loving kindness, which is supported by Hinduism and Buddhism. So whilst these things are external, the religion itself is external, how you internalise them, you don't have to follow the Ten Commandments. If you do, that's an internal judgment that you make. So even though it's an external thing, uh, such as the Ten Commandments is in a book that's external to you, your choice is to internalise them and follow them as your guiding force in life. Belonging to a community with a particular cultural values is an important part of internal self-control. You don't want to break the cultural norms or the cultural values because of that self you know, because of the way that they will judge you. So that becomes part of your self-control. Rational ideology is a set of beliefs that guide and influence our decision making and behaviour. It could be through upbringing, parental influence, religion, culture again. So again, rational ideology is part of what tradition and culture is. And so they start off as forces separate from yourself, but you gradually get internalised via socialisation. Socialisation being a key word. Socialisation is the way that society impacts the way that you behave. The family and community we belong to influences us and becomes part of us and how we see the world. And so this is a display then of the internal forms of social control. Religion, as we've already said, is a major influence on how we behave. The guide by the moral codes um, put forward for us to follow always gives specific examples like I did on the previous slide. Upbringing, especially parental authority, has a huge influence on the way that we abide by the law in that if you are brought up in an extremely strict environment, the chances are you might want to push against those um, forms of social control that were put on you. If you live in a, if you have an upbringing where there are no forms of social control and you could do whatever you want, again, you might not have quite the understanding of the law. So your upbringing really affects the way that you see how you should and should not behave. Traditions, again, like our upbringing, traditions condition us to know how to behave and not commit crimes. Conscience is your own compass uh, where it tells you that you shouldn't commit crimes because it's wrong, linked to religion, upbringing and tradition again. So all of these are interlinked together. Some of them you will follow more than others. Some of them you won't even realise that's why you do what you do. Rational ideology has a, is where people have an idea of what they think is right and wrong, and this can cause them to abide by the law. And finally, internalisation of social rules. This is where your external influences gradually become part of how you think um, and you know what is unacceptable and therefore avoid you from committing crimes.
A question then that you could get asked on this area is for Max, using examples, explain what is meant by internal social control. This is an example that of an answer that you could write about. Um, so I'll just read it through and we'll kind of talk about what we think about this answer. Internal forms of social control are what motivate us not to commit crimes. But these are not written rules, but things that we believe because of the way we have been brought up. For example, family ties help people not to commit crimes as they are attachments. Also, if you have many interests, you concentrate on them and therefore not crime. For example, you may belong to a community group. Belief is another example. Now, I discussed this answer with my class. Um, I would have given it between two to three without looking at the mark scheme uh, and specifically what they were wanting. Um, my, my marking would be between two and three. The reasons for that is this. Um, it's explained what internal forms of social control are. They, they motivate us. It's mentioned family and it's mentioned the idea of your own interests. That's pretty much it, though. We haven't really got a definition. You've got some examples, but they're really vague. You know, family ties help people not to commit crimes. Family ties like what? You know, there's no key words here. There's no rational ideology, there's no tradition, there's no culture, there's no specific examples like the Ten Commandments. Um, you also, you do have a synoptic link there to previous topics, which is the word attachments. Attachments is what Bandura talks about. That's not very clear, though, that that's the link they're trying to make. If they'd have then linked that to Bandora, uh, that would have meant Bandura, sorry, Bandora a, sounds a bit more like the jewellery, um, Bandora, the idea of attachments, that's far better link than just putting the word attachments because that could have just been a complete fluke. So for this, you would need more specific examples, more use of keywords, clearer synoptic links to another topic and a better definition. That's what's missing from that. And that's why two to three would be the marks out of four I would give it. Second round then, external forms of social control. Society has external sources of control too. These ensure we cooperate. They are around us all the time, right from the beginning. As soon as you're born, there are external forms of social control. So again, I got my students to write a list of all the external forms of social control, starting from childhood. So external is often where they use rewards and punishments um, to help us conform. So you could talk about your childhood and how your parents um, in for, you know, enforced social control on you. How was your punishments? Was it you got the naughty step, you got things removed, um, uh, you know, you were able to go to the park, whatever it was. Your teachers will have always enforced social control on you. How did they do that? Did you have isolations, detentions? Did you get, again, put in the naughty corner? What was your... Um, forms of social control, forms of punishment and social control as you were growing up? Um, agencies then of social control in the criminal justice system, agencies include police, they will enforce that social control, they will stop and prevent you from um, breaking the law and if you do break the law there's punishments. Judges and magistrates are obviously the ones that actually put through the far more formal things. Prisons is if you've really committed a serious breach of that social, con uh, breach of your society's norms, expectations that that social control is there and potentially is a deterrent as well for others probation and then sanctions punishments and deterrence uh, these could be penalty notices cautions conditional cautions is arrests um, fines custodial sentences community sentences community service um, solitary confinement removal of privileges so again these things are not just within the criminal justice system these things are often taken into things like schools so in a school you would have solitary confinement which is often called isolation um, or things like that in a school where you're put in a room on your own that's the same idea as what would happen when you're an adult as far as the prison system is concerned removal of privileges you might have your phone taken off you in class there's also curfews and tagging. Certainly if you are on probation and you've had an early release, then curfews and tagging might be put in place. Forms of external social control then, these are the specifics of the ways in which this social control is enforced. The first is coercion. This is where some kind of force is inflicted. 
physical or psychological. So it could be threatened or it could be actual punishment put in place. E.g. in some countries, physical restraints or punishments may be used to force compliance. Um, now, these words are quite strong and they're all key words and important words. Uh, but obviously, we might not feel like we're being forced to comply, but we are. The fear of physical restraint, physical, you know, actual punishment, even psychologically affects you. I can't do that because something might happen. So psychologically, you think... I can't do that, even without, you don't need to see a pair of handcuffs, you don't need to be put in a prison cell to have that fear there, you don't need actual punishment, actually the fear of that coerces you into it. In the UK, being detained or imprisoned are forms of coercion. Fear of punishment then is kind of the offspring of coercion itself, so it's often used as a means of coercion. Things will happen that are against your will and as a consequence of committing uh, an offence, e.g. arrested, put on trial, punished. Some right realists would argue, again right realists linked to unit 2, synoptic link there, would argue that crime would be a lot worse without the fear of punishment, that more people would commit crimes if they didn't fear that punishment. Finally, a deterrence. Oh, sorry, uh, and this acts as a deterrent. Deterrence itself then can be individual as well as general. Individual deterrence then is a person who has committed a crime is given a punishment like suspended sentence or conditional discharge. This then deters them from committing the crime again. It's designed to deter them from offending or re-offending again. If they do not, they're forced to have a more severe punishment or certainly you would hope so. General deterrence then, others are deterred out of fear from committing similar offences and having the same punishment. That's vicarious punishment. So that links into Bandora's argument that you don't do bad things because you see how someone else is punished and therefore vicariously you learn how to behave because you think I don't want that to happen to me. Some policies promote general deterrence and are characterised as getting tough on crime, such as mandatory minimums. This means that you, ha you are given a minimum for a crime that you have committed and there's no negotiating. So a life sentence for murder, which again, I don't think we necessarily have mandatory minimums because in case of murder, the murder, it depends on what the murder is and it depends what you see as a life sentence. Our life sentence is seen as 24 years. People don't interpret that as life. Seven years for a third drug offence, three years for a third burglary. Um, interesting when you look at other places like in America. Amer America has something where um, they have quite strict ones where they basically throw the book at you if you've been caught so many times doing the same act. Whereas for UK, I don't personally know if getting tough on crime that is a good representation of that obviously you can talk about the exam and you can write those as your examples i'm just kind of talking as the you know just on by the by as a as a tangent but three years for doing a third burglary that's that doesn't seem that tough on crime but that's our legal system and that's what they do so when it comes to um Another exam question, explain why imprisonment, going to prison, acts as an external form of social control. So again, within this one, you need your definition of what external sorts, forms of social control are. You need to talk about imprisonment as the actual punishment. You can talk about how how um, vicariously then the fear of going to prison will was forms as a social control, how that's both a deterrent then and a coercion as well. The fact that you know, imprisonment is is um, is there and therefore you want to avoid that. So again, externally affects the way that you behave. And so what you could talk about is the threat of imprisonment. So how it persuades or compels, coerces you. So again, use of your key words there. The fear of possible imprisonment may deter you. Idea of loss of liberties. So again, losing your free will. Um, and the idea of a substantial term of prison, the idea of those mandatory minimum mandatory minimums um, might again, that substantial term of prison might again deter you. So 
And then finally, the fear of the consequences. So the idea of you might not be able to be employed after that, or the idea of how society will deal or treat you as uh, after being in prison as a criminal. And so all of these areas, if you talked about them using the key words, maybe a little bit of vicarious punishment in there from Bandora, you would get your four marks. And as you can see there, there's one, two, three kind of five points there as well um so you have to work hard still for those four marks but the information is fairly straightforward if you've learned uh, the powerpoint um, this was the mark scheme given for this one so obviously the top band detailed explanation um communicates meaning with some specialist vocab specialist vocab being deter coerce um the idea of conforming, the idea of fear of punishment. They're all your key terms. Final section then is the control theory. Now, I don't think the control theory actually says anything particularly different from what we've already said, but it's a key name, it's a key argument, get your marks, we'll still go ahead and go over it. Instead of asking why do people commit crimes and act in devious ways? Instead, control theory asks what makes us conform and obey the laws in the first place. So they kind of flip it on its head. Not once someone's committed a crime, why do they do that? But why do the rest of people abide by the rules and laws? And once you can understand why people abide by the rules and laws and conform to it, you can then understand maybe why they've broken it and how to get them back on track. The key theorists are Travis Hershey and Walter Reckless. I think they're great names. Hershey's control theory then, delinquent acts, naughty acts, occur when an individual's bond to society is weak or broken. So can you think of what he means in any examples? Hershey theorised that a person's bond to society has four elements, attachment, commitment, involvement and beliefs. These are key words again that you need to know. So... Each of the four elements, attachment. To avoid crime, a person needs to have a positive attachment to parents, to school, to peers, to provoke, promote a need for pro-social behaviours in plus, a good social behaviour. And so parents might be, you know, not wanting to disappoint your parents or school might be respect for your teachers and um, peers might be wanting your friends to like you and so because of those attachments to those areas you behave in a certain manner that's seen as acceptable for me a lot of the you know a lot of growing up i i never wanted to kind of disappoint or let down my parents that was a huge driving force as to why i did not deviate from the norms of what was expected of me Commitment. If a person has ambition to achieve positive future goals, such as a good job or comfortable home, they are less likely to commit crime. I'm not going to commit a crime. I'm not anyway, but I'm not going to commit a crime because I'm not going to put my job at jeopardy. My job is my life as far as it pays for my mortgage. It, it, it gives me the lifestyle I, you know, require and enjoy. I'm not going to break the law and risk that. Or you might have ambitions to become lawyers. You might have ambitions to become police officers. You can't then break the law and have all of those future ambitions destroyed. One crime for the rest of your life. No, not worth it. Involvement. Those who are involved in social activities such as playing in sports teams or belonging to a community club or group are less prone to crime. Why? Because you don't want to let your teammates down. Think of the disgrace. If you're in a sports team and then you do something and how your teammates respond and react to that, how you let them down. People again are driven by that group mentality of not letting other people down. Finally, beliefs. A belief in society's values such as honesty is needed and belief that committing crime is wrong. So this is just a belief that you want to be a good person, that honesty is the right way forward, the, the belief that you shouldn't commit crimes. Now, I think the beliefs out of all of them doesn't work as well because the only reason why certain things are a crime is because you're told they're a crime by, you know, by the House of Commons, the House of Laws that decide the rules, the rulings that happen. At the end of the day, 
like in America and this country, um, you know, smoking marijuana is illegal. That's seen as a crime. In America, certain states it's a crime, other states it's not. So you could not, you could get arrested for smoking marijuana in one state, drive across the border and, and you know, light up a spliff and then you're, you're not breaking the law. How is it then, where does the belief come from that when crime itself is so subjective, when you 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 know you could move to another country and mar have more than one wife that's then not a crime in certain countries but it's a crime over here so i think for me for beliefs that's maybe the more questionable one because where do our beliefs come from if we're just told what we should and shouldn't do decided by somebody else but again that's a bit on the side you don't really need to evaluate these it's just a thought to have Walter Reckless's control theory then, he calls this containment, good keyword, make sure you use it. We resist committing crime due to inner and outer containment, inner, inside, outer, outside. Inner upbringing, especially our family, outer social groups, laws of society. Reckless said that a combination of both inner psychological containments and external social containments stop people from deviating from the norms and committing crimes. Nothing particularly groundbreaking there. I don't think there's anything different he says than anybody else. However, he's a name, he's got a key word, good for your marks. So, inner, of course, is going to be psychological because it's inside you, so it's in your head, so it's psychological. Outer, of course, is outside of you, so it's where social groups, etc., um, including the laws, have an impact on you. But this idea that you are contained by both of them to behave in a law-abiding and not deviant manner. Finally, an eight marker discuss the different forms of social control. So with this one, you've got a full mark answer there. Everything about this answer screams full marks. So whilst it's a discuss question, you don't need to actually discuss as far as strengths and weaknesses you just need to consider and talk about all the different forms so let me just quickly read through this um, so that you can pinpoint and highlight why this got full marks so there are two types of social control internal and external so straight into the clarity of defining the two different types internal is where we obey the law without being compelled to do so so definition eg our conscience tells us what is right conscience keyword according to freud our conscience or superego is an internal nagging parent making us feel guilty if we even think of breaking norms synoptic link there to freud and it's specific use freud's word superego use freud's idea of guilty so that would get you two to three marks straight away what you can also notice from this answer is there's four clear bullet points four clear points that's going to be four marks straight away add in synoptic links add in keywords add in specific examples add in detail there's your eight marks so that's exactly what this example shows we get our conscience through socialization keyword where we learn society's moral code from institutions like the family and religion for example specific example given the ten commandments teach believers that it is a sin to steal or murder we internalize keyword rules and traditions as part of our personality and conscience we can then work out for ourselves what is right and wrong this means we have a rational ideology key term by contrast, external social control is where agencies like those in the CJS use coercion, false or threat, to make us obey the law, such as police can arrest us, magistrates can fine us, prisons can lock us up. Fabulous. Fabulous sentence there. You have the definition of you know, it being external agencies, you've got a keyword with coercion, and then that example is fabulous. You've got three different examples there and the specifics of how they will treat you. Police, arrest, magistrates, fine prisons lock you up likewise parents peers and teachers etc use negative sanctions key terms to make us conform to their rules external control works through fear of punishment key term we obey the law for fear of prison this reflects bandura's social learning theory seeing others punished for uh, deviance so for deviance so it deters us again nice synoptic link there Control theorists like Reckless see both internal and external control as necessary to ensure people obey the law. He argues that socialisation produces internal containment by teaching us self-control to resist temptations to offend. External controls like discipline by parents produce external containment. Very, very nice answer. 
a lot there to write for an eight marker, a lot there to write for the time that you're given in the exam. You'll probably have about 12 minutes to write that. However, nothing on there is something that you cannot do. There is nothing on there that is not achievable. It, you, the PowerPoint goes, the PowerPoint I've just done goes over everything you need, the examples, the synoptic links. So you are all capable of getting full marks in an answer like that, um, because none of that is too difficult to revise or learn either. You just have to sit down and do it. So eight marks is easily achievable with a bit of hard work. Um, another one, discuss the reasons why individuals abide by the law. Um, how might you answer this? Again, self-control, the, the different types, internalisation, the learning from it, rational ideology, um, the reckless arguments. Um, and again, some different points that you could talk about. Coercion, fear of punishment, deterrence, reward and punishments. So very, very similar to the previous one, but these are just the specific individuals that... Um, enforce that social and control both internal and external um hope you found this video useful uh, please give me a thumbs up if you did don't forget to subscribe i will be regularly doing more videos to help you through your unit four and um, so please subscribe so that you never miss out on a video and if you've got any questions or comments please feel free to post them beneath and i always do try and respond as best as i can right thank you very much for watching everyone bye for now